Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the final day here at the wonderful Excel Center and the Feed the World stage, where we are discussing all matters relating to food production, climate change, and everything agriculture related. I'm Andrew Meredith, the editor of Farmers Weekly, the UK's biggest farming magazine, and we're very proud to host a very talented and knowledgeable panel for our first session of the day today as we talk about climate change and the food of tomorrow, the facts and the fiction. So we're going to have a short presentation from each of our panelists here this morning, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Andrew Neal, a microbiologist and soil systems research scientist with Rotham Said Research. Uh, Jill Covey, uh, uh, a breeding station manager at, at seed specialist KWS. Jonathan Henry, managing director at Garford Farm Machinery and Christian Reynolds, a senior lecturer at City University Centre for Food Policy. So they're each going to talk through an aspect of the topic, as I say, climate change and the food of tomorrow. And then when they've all concluded, there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A. And I'm sure as you listen, there'll be some brilliant questions that you'll come up with that they can tackle for you. And of course, Many of the panelists here have also got a display in the, in the um, section behind me, so do go and see KWS or Garford um, or Rothamsted to hear this uh, today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Andrew Neal and he'll kick things off. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, so I suppose thinking about this topic about uh, climate change, agriculture and the future food, um, probably a good idea to start about what we're learning just recently about soil and how it works. Over the last decade or so, uh, as we've been able to take advantage of sequencing technologies, we've been really starting to fill in some of the gaps of knowledge to do with what biology is doing in soil. So we're now starting to see soil very differently than we probably did at the end of the last century, where it was very much about chemistry and physics. We're filling in those holes about biology. We're now understanding that soil is a living system, and so how we're going to be managing soil in the future will be much more tuned to soil as a living process. So we're starting to see soil now as an, as an adaptive, uh, porous material rather than just a solid medium. Um, an adaptive meaning that it's able to change, and the biology in that is able to change the structure and the way the soil behaves. And that's really important when we think about climate change because what drives that uh, adaptive response is the amount of carbon being put through the system. So one of the key issues at the moment, discussing soil as a potential to ameliorate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's starting to overwhelm the real deep understanding of soil not as a carbon storage facility but really as a carbon processing facility and it's that processing that continual turning over of carbon through the system that creates the fine pore structure that is so unique to soil if you think about it soil is not only uh well soil really is unique in our own solar system and probably unique in the, in the universe as being a porous medium full of life there's lots of places where you can find dust blowing around the earth is probably the only place so far we've identified where that soil is a living system. So what does that biology do in soil? That biology creates the porous structure as carbon is broken down, eventually it gets to a molecular scale where it interacts with mineral particles. Once it's at that scale, it starts to act as a glue and it starts to form structure which gives us this fine porous uh, structure in soil that is so important for holding water. So that's the first function that soil needs to do for us in the future. As we're getting longer, drier summers in the UK, the advantage of having soil that is able to hold on to a lot of water is going to be really beneficial for crops during the summer. So soil holds water, but it also allows oxygen to flow through the system. And we know that soils that have a high amount of oxygen running through the system put biology in a very good place put biology into a place where it uh, builds more biomass. It holds nutrients in the system rather than leaking out of the system. So having carbon flowing through that system gives us that pore network. It puts biology into the right place, which means plants can access water, they can access nutrients, and 
you have this much more fine scale sponge-like material. If you look at sap soil in a pore space, or it's in a pore situation, it has very little pore space, there's very little capacity to hold water, and there's very little oxygen in there, and biology drives that process metabolically in the absence of oxygen to produce nitrous oxide and methane as products of alternative respiration, where there's no oxygen to respire, nitrate and, uh, and carbon starts to be used as alternative electron receptors, and that's when we get a lot of greenhouse gas production lost to the atmosphere. So understanding that it's not the quantity of carbon in soil that's important, but the maintenance of flowing carbon through that system that is the most beneficial thing we can do, leads us on to how we might be looking at agriculture in the future, where at the moment, I think only a limited number of farmers are thinking about the soil. There's been a lot of uh, focusing on the requirements of plants, plant nutrition to maximize yield. I think what you will start to see over the next 10, 15 years, and some farmers are already doing this, is starting to think that actually one of their most vital resources on the farm is the soil. And running that, maintaining that in a very positive place where it's building biomass, building water storage capacity, and maintaining nutrients within the system is where farmers are starting to look at. So, what are they going to do to achieve that? they'll probably be disturbing the soil less. We know that plowing is one of the most detrimental processes that, can, that a soil can be subject to, particularly for the stocks of carbon in that soil. But plowed soil, it loses carbon rapidly once after disturbance. So minimizing that disturbance will be crucial for keeping carbon within the system. One way of doing that is growing cover crops. So keeping the soil covered, keeping it protected from the elements, keeping it cool as we get an awful lot of longer, longer uh, higher amounts of temperature and sunshine, keeping that the surface of the soil protected with a permanent covering of cover crops will also be, you'll start to see that stuff become used more effectively. And to manage that system, we're going to have to move to something like direct drilling. So you'll see much less plowing and much more direct drilling of seeds within a living uh, cover crop, herbal lay sort of approach. So you're going to see sy systems change. Hopefully we would see much less bare soil, and much more permanent cover of soil. And finally, I suppose that this whole concept will start to engage with livestock producers and have, will go back to more mixed farming systems because we know livestock are one of the key ways of maintaining and getting organic matter into soil. So rather than disturbing the soil where you have a lot of permanent cover, grazing that off and then direct drilling straight into that green herbal layer. Uh, so I think the whole process will be one of protecting and maintaining carbon in soil, keeping that flow through, getting soil into a very positive state for water holding capacity, plant nutrition, but also doing that at the same time as you're minimizing the amount of disturbance to soil. So we can see a very different way of managing systems uh, and managing the whole system rather than just focusing on the, on the yield of the crop. So I think I'll stop there. Passing on. Thank you. So leading on from that, if we're talking about the plants, the plant varieties, the types of crops that we're growing, one thing we know is that the population is increasing. So we're going to have to produce more food from a smaller area. So what can we do to do that? So um, I come from plant breeding. Um, we are looking at genetics. Um, our breeding is done in the environment. And this is a changing environment, as we know. So climate change is, is happening. Um, so we're already breeding within the environment and adapting those genetics better for the environment of today compared to a few years ago. As well as that, we can also have more targeted approach where we're looking at particular genes. So this might be looking at resource efficiency. So um, Andy mentioned there in terms of nutrient use, might be water use, etc. So we have drought trials specifically as well in different locations, both within the UK, but also overseas as well where we're really trying to target in what can we do in plant varieties or the future to produce more resilient types of crops, um, so within the varieties, but also the 
the type of crops themselves for farmers to grow. Because indeed with the challenges, there, there are a huge number of challenges facing farmers today, will the portfolio of crops that they grow need to change? Andy mentioned there about cover crops. So some farmers are already doing that. One of the um, key words at the moment is regenerative agriculture. Um, a lot of farmers have adopted this with the direct drilling. And so that is one of the approaches to really combat climate change, look at how they're working the whole farm system. And that will also potentially open up, are there particular varieties that are better suited to that kind of farming system? We haven't really got those through in terms of the genetics through to a, a level where we've got commercial varieties that are specifically targeted for that system. But that could be a possibility for the, the future going forward and we're working on that right now. So we need to feed more people. Um, we need to try and get the best genetics to produce resilient varieties of the future going forward. And we need to see in terms of the range of crops that's being grown, is it going to stay as it is or will that change? I'll hand over to... Switching microphone. Okay, so good morning everybody. My name is Jonathan Henry and I'm the managing director of a company called Garford Farm Machinery. Uh, we manufacture equipment which weeds mechanically crops, either broad acre crops where we can weed between the, uh, the rows of crop or uh, precision planted uh, crops, mainly uh, fresh produce, uh, vegetables where we can also mechanically weed between the plants and we can do that um, obviously without, without chemicals. So our primary market is those crops where there is no active ingredient uh, that, 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 that can, can operate in that space. Um, but also we're seeing more and more uh, our systems being uh, adopted in broad agar systems and used in combination with chemical product for the reduction of that and also for extended resilience um, of those products uh, and extending the life of them. So. My background is um, 30 years in the farm equipment business, um, uh, 30 years with a large corporate, and I had the great luxury to work on projects all over the world, um, projects for farmers in China, projects for farmers across the CIS, projects uh, for customers across the, the European Union or Western Europe, North America, and South America. And I have been on all the major farming production systems in the world. I've been on those soils, I've interviewed customers uh, extensively and led major investment programs to develop products and services for them. So I have a, a lot of experience, I don't have a lot of expertise like the rest of the panel, but I have a lot of experience of farming systems and how farmers operate in those different systems. And um, that's my, that's my skill set, I would say. Um, one thing I would say is that I believe farmers are actually really, really good at what they do. And that's because the world and society asks them to produce lots of food really, really cheaply. So if we want to change that, we need to understand that we need to lead and guide and put policy and framework in place that helps those farmers change what they do. And farmers do understand soils. That's their biggest resource in their business. It's the biggest capital spend they have is on that land. So they know about that, but it doesn't mean that they don't understand the consequences they're making sometimes when the choices that they choose are made. And um, if we're going to change this, it's going to, that's going to take strong leadership and it's going to take strong collaboration because we have a global food system and uh, regulation is not global and uh, coordination of that. One thing I can say here, I think, which will not be debated on this panel, fixing this is a huge challenge and it's gonna need really, really smart people to make that happen. And it's gonna need tremendous collaboration to make that happen uh, over the next decades as we transition to a more sustainable space. And of course, doing that because no government in the world is gonna to want to increase the cost of that food. And that's the, the conundrum, and we need to find that, uh, that balance so we can still feed the world and feed a growing world. So I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Dr. Christian Reynolds from the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London. So I come at this from a uh, consumer or sustainable diets angle. And so thinking about this, we have the how to feed the world stage 
not just talking about how to feed the UK stage. And I think you were exactly right there in saying farmers globally are facing immense challenges. And farmers give a damn about what they want to produce, and they want to produce things that are nutritious, are healthy, and are sustainable, not just for the planet, but also sustainable to pass the farm on to future generations. It's business sustainability. It's a sustainability of the uh, society, not just sustainability of the planet. It's a wider and broader definition. So the reasons I'm saying this is, I'm going to say, let's talk about net zero, and let's talk about where we need to be in five years' time, in 10 years' time, and what that means for agriculture in the UK and globally. So the animal in the room, if I want to say elephant in the room, but the animal in the room is currently global agriculture is about 28% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 8% of that is to, due to loss and waste. So 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions are linked to waste that happens within the global food supply chain. Of that 28, uh, 28, 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions, there is animal agriculture as part of that, as well as other forms of agriculture. But the thing to recognize is there are different solutions at different points of this chain. But the other thing to highlight is the solutions we're talking about on farm level, at the consumer level, etc., they're part of the same package. If consumers start changing their behavior, that affects the farm. If farmers start changing their behavior, that, as you've just said, might cost more, but it might have other impacts as well, such as the different sorts of varieties that you'll get in your supermarket. The two happen together, which means we need to think about what we as consumers can actually do to support farmers, as well as what farmers can do to actually make our lives easier as consumers. So there's a lot of give and take there. And I guess the big thing that I want to highlight if we're thinking about the future of farming is that a lot of our forecasts or government policy right now is looking at a one to two degree shift of climate already. So that means even in our current targets, there are going to be more extreme weather events. There's going to be more flooding. There's going to be more rainfall. And as we've said, we've got to breed better. We've got to farm smarter. We've got to farm for more nutrition, farm for more sustainability, and get smarter on farm, as you've just said, with the machinery. So there's been some great work done at Oxford and Cambridge recently, looking at if you give farmers the data about their farms, they farm with a 5 to 10% lower carbon footprint just through having the information there, because they want to farm a so actually giving farmers the data and being data driven in their, their decision making really helps, which means the seed breeding, the machinery, all of it can work together. Now, I don't want to frighten everybody here, but there was a thing called the Little Ice Age, and that happened between 1300 to 1700. Sorry, I'm going all history on a feed the world thing. But 1300 to 1700, there was a giant, there was a cooling period. Over that time, the world cooled by up to half a degree centigrade. That half a degree centigrade led to rye harvest collapses. It led to wheat harvest collapses throughout that time period. It led to famines throughout Europe and a change towards a more dairy-centric farming system throughout Europe, which meant the varieties that survived to today are the ones that survived for that global cooling. They're the ones we were left to start breeding with and land races for. So this means all of these hungers, these famines over that time period were a 0.5 degree change. We're now forecast for a one or two degree change of warming. So if you think about the dramatic shifts that have happened in terms of starvation, famines, crop failures from 13 to 1700, there was dramatic changes to the agrarian landscape. And so if we're thinking what's going to happen in the future, we can think about British horticulture and agriculture leading the way. We have smarter farmers. We know what to do with the soils in terms of regenerative agriculture. And our carbon footprint of our animal products are lower than that globally. So if you think about this, on average, if for a kilo of beef, it's about 40, 46, kilo, uh, 46 kilograms of CO2 per kilo of beef globally. In the UK, it's only 17 kilos of CO2. So a dramatic reduction of the amount of CO2 that we actually need to be uh, you know, producing. If you want to eat beef, British beef, British lamb, British poultry, they're all much more sustainably produced as a whole than any of the other global ones. So if we're thinking in terms of feed the world stage, we could be thinking about how we can export more of our existing crop. However, I was saying also that the consumer is also to, needs to be talking here. 
And the important thing to think with the consumer is that we're currently actually eating too much red meat, too much animal proteins for our health. So currently, the average meal, if you're eating that, is about 150 grams of red or processed meat is the average amount eaten. The public health guidance is saying we only need 70 to 90 grams of red or processed meat, and we don't eat enough vegetables. So if you're thinking of that, farmers, we need to be farming this for rural livelihoods, but where it's going and what we're actually producing needs to be thought of in terms of the future of farming. So we need to be farming better, farming smarter, and actually supporting the things that work in the UK so we can have a resilient system that actually supports the farmers and also supports our food security. Currently, the UK imports 60% of its fruits and vegetables. It imports lots of dairy products and imports lots of pig pig products as well, less, uh, less beef. So if we're thinking about that and global supply chains are starting to be disrupted, that's going to have some massive impacts. You know, I've done some calculations and if we're thinking about the cost of living and the increase in fertilizer prices, for instance, that's been a 12% jump since the pounds changed. So farmers' input costs are going up. And so the way we need to be doing is farming smarter and looking at what we can grow locally to be more um, supportive of that agriculture sector. Sorry, that was a lot of different messages there. But basically, we can be farming smarter and we can be supporting our farmers by changing what we eat. And that means a little bit less meat, but not knocking it out, but a heck of a lot more British horticulture, lots more vegetables, lots more other products. Sorry, that's a lot of messages there. Hopefully not too terrifying to say we need to change, but the farmers can change and are really good at their jobs. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Christian, and thank you to all of our panelists for a really thought-provoking start to the morning. I think we've tackled probably some really big ideas there just to get everyone woken up. Um, and I was really struck. I think we're all in agreement that I think probably about our long-term ambitions, and it's just marrying up the short-term impetus and incentive often for farmers, consumers, everyone to probably do the wrong things in the abstract, in the here and now, while, have, while retaining that ambition to do the right thing in the long term. It's just how to start and then how to keep going. So, are there any questions for our panellists here this morning? Yes, please. Perhaps we might need one of those mics. I'd like to ask Professor Neil, um, how can the government actually help farmers to change without the financial incentive that they used to give them in the, in the past? There's also financial incentive to do what was what they thought was the right or the wrong thing. Um, how they can how can they can encourage them to do the right things that are necessary now? So, so one of the one of the supposed advantages of, of getting out of the European Union is to apparently free, up, free farmers from the shackles of the uh, agricultural policy that was imposed across the EU. I think there was a lot of problems with that because it encouraged, it paid farmers for owning land rather than what they did with it. So up until recently, the government was actually thinking about this in a very positive way. It was, it was moving away from just paying them for owning land, moving towards payment for what you did with that land, uh, and it was an encouragement to do practices that were beneficial for above ground biodiversity, but also for sequestering carbon in soil, and as part of that sequestration you get that continual pumping of carbon through the system that is good for it. So uh, I think in many cases, and I know, I know uh, when uh, Michael Gove was head of DEFRA, there was a large uh, large efforts to go out and talk to farmers and scientists about what needed to be done and it, it, that discussion struck me as, as very genuine and very uh, detailed uh, but of course since Michael Gove has left DEFRA has dragged its heels on, on implementing this and now just recently uh, since this trust has come in that, that whole notion of, of, of helping farmers achieve what they want to uh, has been swept aside and apparently we're now going back to the payment for just owning that. So I, I think government has, government has tried, not probably hard enough, and it hasn't implemented it quick enough, but I think I'm sort of heartened that some people in government are thinking about this. You know, practically, things get in the way and, and um, 
and the process has stopped. But I think that's what we need to be thinking about, is that farmers are guardians of, of the land as well as food producers and, and rewarding them for adopting the per practical management that is of benefit to all of us, I think, is the right way to go. Um, but I'm a little less pumped that it's actually ever going to be implemented the way we're going at the moment. Does anyone else want to come in on that before we move on? So I'll just say, um, we have a farm at home. Um, and in terms of that as well, we've uh, looked at a lot of the government policies and being involved in some of those, etc. Um, I think, yeah, there's uh, there are some good ideas. Um, and farmers are very open to trying to um, do more for the environment, um, do more to mitigate climate change, etc. Quite often they'll they'll go into some of these schemes, but then in actual fact sort of lose interest because in that there's nothing actually coming through to them in the end in terms of um, support and money etc. Because in the end it is it does have to work out financially as well. Um, I think farmers could group together a lot more. There, there could be um, more organisations set up where farmers link up together um, and then access government support in some way if it's there um, but I think there needs to be a lot more activity there to um, to really show farmers how they can do this um, and then I think probably once it gains momentum um, it might go a lot further uh, there, there are groups the non-farming groups who are doing this in certain um, ways and sometimes in actual fact you find them and it's sort of like well you've got no one involved who's doing any farming in this group, but you're talking about doing lots with uh, different areas of land. And so also those groups engaging with the farmers, whether the government could actually help to support that and facilitate that, I think would be a good thing. Um, I just want to add that um, what's just happened is exactly the worst thing that can happen to bring agriculture forward because agriculture as a production system has a much longer lead time than many other manufacturing or production systems that exist. What they need and the, and the remedies that are necessary aren't just a single year or a two year or a three year. Some of these are decades long um, developments that are necessary. So a policy framework must have leadership and vision but it must also have stability of intent and maintain the, itself for the duration. Doing what's just happened where something's been proposed to change and then suddenly pausing and not knowing if we're gonna go ahead with it is completely the worst thing that could happen. We better than not even talking about it in terms of actually getting that implemented. So it's gonna take leadership and all farmers in the world compete with each other. If you're producing wheat in the UK, you're competing with a Kansas wheat farmer or a Western Canadian wheat farmer because that's ultimately it's a global commodity. So this is another piece of it is it needs stability in that policy and it also needs fairness because to get buy-in from those producers, they need to believe that, um, that there is being managed fairly. I believe that Dieter Heim and his vision for this is actually one of the best that's ever been put together as policy. And I've talked to many, many ag economists around the world who buy in and believe that that is the right step and the UK can lead here and set an example. But it's got to be, there's got to be a commitment and then we've got to make the plan and then walk the plan and stick to it. So not to um, rain on the parade, because I agree, the policy, the ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, was very pioneering, but it missed out horticulture entirely. So all of the crops around London, all of the horticulture, a lot of the employment for agriculture, the highest level of uh, agri um, labor within it is in the horticulture group. And so if we're thinking of sustainable economies, sustainable communities, and where we're actually going forward, a lot of the arable, a lot of other sorts of agriculture is becoming much more machine driven. But it meant that a lot of the human on farm um, uh, agriculture, so the horticulture I should say, um, did not have as much incentive to become more environmentally friendly. 
to be going for biodiversity, to be looking after their soils. And it was going for much more, say, the Dutch model of greenhouses, very high tech, very um, away from nature. And so it was just highlighting that there are room for improvement in the environmental land management scheme that we currently have, but just to throw it all out the window and expect us to go to something else is a terrifying thing. As, as you've just said, the lead times on this, the decisions, the amount of infrastructure that's had to go in to building elms up to where it is, this land management um, it, it has been astronomical. The amount of just brain power by and passion by so many people in actually implementing this on the ground and having farmers across the country buy into this scheme quite literally with their own money to see that all thrown away is absolutely terrifying and heartbreaking to me because it is, well, will, what's happening already is showing that changes to farming at this scale can produce biodiversity, it can produce lower carbon footprints, and it can produce resilience in communities. But will it stop? And we, you know, we're two weeks out from this major announcement. So governments can buy it. Well, I think we can do these things. And I think if we're wanting the ray of hope, it's lobbying from a consumer angle the supermarkets and the supermarkets to do two things do whole crop purchases because that means they're taking everything off the farm and they're paying the farmers a living wage for all of their crop which means they can employ people for the entire season and then also asking them to do parts of elms as part of their purchase orders which means that farmers are actually locked into contracts where they do that as a benefit and the supermarkets can actually start claiming that as a positive as well the supermarkets because there are so few of them can actually support this if they wanted to they can actually use this as a powerful card to say we are being sustainable the british government is not they are probably one of the few groups left i think who, if we lobby them enough as consumers and wider groups, actually do this and lock everybody in to the ELM strategy. So yeah, the government right now is full of inaction, but there are people within the supply chain who can support farmers to do this if we want to. Next question, please. I hear everything that you've, that you've all said, but unfortunately, the aspirations of the industry run counter to the orthodoxy within government. You referenced the procrastination about the implementation of ELMS. The lump sum exit scheme, which is just coming on stream now by government, will actively encourage people to leave the industry. So what do you see as the way forward? So, really good question talking about farmers leaving the industry. And I think one of the big challenges globally is an aging farm population. So, if you talk about Thailand, if you talk about China, if you talk about anywhere, there are people coming in, but the average age of the farmers, of farmers is increasing, and that is proving its own challenges. Um, I am less of an expert in this area and bow to the rest of the panel, but it is that challenge of there are farmers who are aging and there are farmers coming in and they're not in the same amount and we need brilliant research universities such as this to train up the next generation to be open to these different new ideas. But anyway, I'll pa pass on. Do you want to, because you've actually... That, 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 that's common the world over is that the age of um, farmers is, is continuing to grow and, and increase and there are a number of countries that have put schemes in place to transition the business um, leadership to the next generation faster and there's really strong data about how that uh, accelerates innovation because of course it's, it's human nature if you've been through a rough period in your business the likelihood you will take future risk is diminished so younger you know, younger entrepreneurs are more likely to take risk and adopt innovation that's just a, a human nature factor it, it appears in all sectors farming needs to address that I would just say that that's one of the reasons why we're here today and have been for the last two days really is that um, agriculture farming is quite often seen as a very hard work very long hours unsociable um, you, not for not very much money really and so people go elsewhere the youngsters go elsewhere the expertise goes out in actual fact it's an extremely high-tech industry it can be there's huge amounts of science which is needed and so we do need these these younger people and so I think it's, it's about the whole industry selling farming and agriculture as a really exciting industry to be in. There's so many different uh, jobs, etc. We need these entrepreneurs. We need the, the scientists to really drive innovation as well forward. So I think 
But one thing that I, I find very fascinating about farming is that often in the discussion focuses on on producing food and, and yields and, and how we treat the environment. But first and foremost, farming is a sociological exercise, right? And I think uh, there are very interesting uh, issues around um, the way things used to be done and and the fact that the younger generation of farmers who are all itching to get onto the land but are often you know kept out of it because it's too expensive or because their grandfather is still farming or that um, I think there's a huge enthusiasm for embracing new technology that is stymied because either generations are working on the farm together and, and the younger generations are prevented from adopting new things because we've never done it that way. Um, so, so seeing some sort of turnover, some churn in, in, in who is farming the land could actually be quite beneficial. And if, if I think of a lot of the farmers that I work with that are adopting a lot of regenerative practices, often they're people that have made their money elsewhere and have bought a farm because they want to practice that way of farming um, and I think having grown up in Devon uh, I saw that as quite a negative thing of pricing farmers off the, off the land but now now I've worked with those farmers and I understand the sort of social side of it a bit more I can see that there are benefits to people that come in wanting to implement a, a new strategy on a farm without any of the baggage of my family has farmed here for 150 years and this is the way we do it. And I think it's not all doom and gloom. If people are leaving the industry, that's also an opportunity for change. So it's not all negative, I guess I, I would say. There's so many ways into this topic, it's so big. But the one thing I'd just like to pick on, I was thinking while you were doing your opening remarks, is the debate around land sparing versus land sharing. Um, should we be going hell for leather effectively and sacrificing some parts of our land, perhaps where we have the most fertile soils, to maximise the amount of food we can produce on there in order to preserve, rewild even, other less productive parts of the country? And will that have a, a net positive effect for nature? Or should we be trying to do the most sustainable practices everywhere, even at the cost perhaps of lower yields? It's a really tough one, and I, I, I would love to hear the views of the rest of the panel. I'm just jumping in first because I'm enthusiastic. Um, so I was part of a thing called the National Food Strategy. And so the National Food Strategy was released in 2022 to much fanfare, and Boris Johnson said we're not having any of that, and it kind of has disappeared slightly. Um, but I was part of the community forum. So we visited communities up and down the country and talked over issues from farming through to junk food on high streets, through to every single issue facing kind of the British food system, all these different challenges, and got people's views on how to actually combat them. And the thing that struck me was in every different community, they had a different opinion on land sparing versus land sharing. So some communities were very much, we'll have some farming and some very, very um, kind of shared um, environmental area. So we'll be doing a sharing or sparing. All of that part over there, all of Dartmoor, that's going to be totally sh uh, uh, spared and we'll farm intensively elsewhere. Lots of communities around the country didn't have the same views on this. And so I think if we're talking about local community sustainability, it's also got to be what's right for the local community in terms of how we farm that area. Because the farmers who are there also know that land best and know what is not sustainable, know what is not profitable land. And that could actually be rewilded at a much easier amount than land that is very, very fecund. You know, think about how London has expanded. We've taken so much good soil under these buildings right now or uh, around all of these areas. And that's not an efficient way of farming if we were doing yields at our maximum level and not actually thinking where people live. So I think there's a big trade-off there. But I also think, and this is possibly more unpopular, that we do need to have a discussion of where animal agriculture is happening within the UK and what we actually want from animal agriculture within these different areas. Because there's certain parts where we could actually be growing lots more um, plant-based crops on those lands more efficiently, but you're getting a higher rate of cash return 
off those uh, areas from um, animal-based agriculture currently. So we do need to have that discussion. And the simulations or models from different um, people in, the, in academia have shown that mixes of land sparing versus land sharing across the country do work, but it has to be for the right amount for the right areas and the right biodiversity. So it's not all just about woodlands, it's not all just about um, intensive farming, there are balances. But the other question there is feed because we're currently importing a lot of feed from elsewhere, and if we're doing intensive agriculture, feed is going to become one of these issues that we're going to have to face, because it's our wider global footprint for feeding the world, not just feeding the UK. And that's an entirely different can of worms, but I'll pass over in terms of hearing other thoughts on, oh, I'd love to hear about just how your um, machines, for instance, can actually enable more sparing sharing in terms of being so precise with what they have, or how you harvest. If it's being super cheap. I was just going to add that uh, on this topic, I think it's a, an area where the policy needs to be really, really carefully managed. Because if it's not, you can end up with completely the wrong outcomes. And um, I, I've seen that uh, local to where I live in Lincolnshire, where um, investment communities putting money into um, arable land and they want the most depleted land because the index will be the lowest and have the highest increase. And that isn't that type of policy is not going to right, drive the right choices in this in, in, in this discussion. So, um, of all of the policy requirements we talked about, this one um, possibly needs um, the most careful management. That's what I was going to say. So, just thinking in terms of. Yeah, should we produce? Should we maximise yield from certain areas, or should we have a more um, average yield in a way and adopt more environmentally friendly practices across all the area um, and perhaps including cover crops, direct drilling, etc. Um, yeah, the, we could probably have a discussion for many, many hours, I think, on this topic. Um, really, if you look across the globe, if you just took wheat, for example, the average yield is actually less than four tons per hectare, but in some areas, yeah, the top yield is over 17 tons per hectare. So there's a massive variation across across the globe. Um, is it right that we're still producing wheat in those areas where the yield is very low? I think, just as uh, Christian mentioned there, I mean, it's very dependent on, on that country, on that community, what's needed there. Um, and in terms of the high yielding areas, it doesn't have to be sort of averaged out across the farm. You can have the areas around the margins of the field, of course, where you've got the environmental corridors to allow the wildlife to move through, and then you can maximize on the center of the field um, and really get those higher yields. You can still, with that, adopt some of these other farming measures, such as the direct drilling. Um, but from a farmer point of view as well, um, they really need to go into, they're, they're either in that or they're not in that in a way because they're looking at farming systems. So it's a whole different way of farming. Um, I, sh I would say that most farmers have adopted that in some capacity, but it's a whole change in machinery on a, on a farm to adopt um, full direct drilling in terms of your staff, in terms of what you do. Um, so very much a um, personal view, I think, of the individual areas, whether that be the community or the individuals. But we do need to yeah, produce food. So it makes sense to produce as much as possible from some really high productive areas, I would say. Yeah, I think that the high productive areas is a very important point because something I don't hear a lot in the discussions is that so we know, for instance, if you've got very sandy soils, they're lousier sequestering carbon, they're leaky so a lot of the nutrients you put in there are lost very rapidly and I'd like to see some sort of national strategy for understanding what we do with our sandy soils. We may decide that they're the ones we shouldn't be growing crops on but doing something you know, something more environmentally driven. Uh, so that's something I would really like to see, some sort of national strategy about where we should be growing our crops. But I think there's also, like you say, within field if, if you adopt sort of integrated pest management approaches where you have uh, strips of wildflowers either around the outside or even more effectively up through the field so that beneficials have a chance to get deeper into the crop. I think that's it's not really sparing or sharing, but it's a way of 
of combining agricultural productivity with, with environmental benefits as well. So there are many ways to do it. And again, I just don't think we have a national strategy or the drive to have a national strategy to think about how we do this most effectively as a country, which then has a real marketing potential for when we try and sell to the rest of the world. Because we're one of the best places in the world to, to have livestock growing on grass all year round. Uh, and I don't think we, we make enough of that, we make enough of it for our environmental benefits. Um, and it, but it's something that needs to be done. Perhaps the supermarkets are the ones that need to lead that. I, I get the impression that a lot of people are sort of very gradually giving up on government ever doing anything useful anymore. And we just need to, we all know what we need to do. We just need to find the like-minded people to act together, to, to put it into practice and ignore the government. Now that Andrew's got the mic in his hand, I have another question for him, but do we have any more from the audience? Yes, please. What the panel's opinions are on the advisory services that are available, have been available in the past, and should be available in the future, given that we are moving towards environmental land management, and farmers do need to know how to do this effectively. Who wants to start that? I can start on that. So, yeah, I think um, I think we've got a lot of opportunity in that space to do. Actually, we used to be much more structured at getting technical information onto farms, and we retracted from that and put the resource into the science. And now the problem is getting that drive shaft connected again. And um, and I think that's a key piece because when you move away from inversion tillage and a secondary tillage and and and, and a, 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 a very prescriptive seeding system then when you do that, there is more agronomy required on the farm, a deeper understanding of that, moisture contents, um, the, you know, the, the, the expertise required at farm level increases significantly when you do that. And we've retracted in the last three decades in terms of how we as a country provide that to, um, to primary agriculture. If I can be very, very cheeky, I'm a big fan of the advisory services and I feel they have been gutted over the last hundred years. There is very little advisory service that is not also co-sponsored by commercial organizations or um, saying use these particular fertilizers, use these particular pesticides, use these particular pieces of kit. And that is a shame in some ways because there is not really an unbiased service that is within the UK. But I feel there could be, and there could be a lot more investment in that area. So uh, at City University of London, we r I run a night course called The Political Economy of Food, and it looks at where farmers are getting their information as one of the topics, because uh, you can see over these last hundred years or so, the type of advice over the last hundred years has changed as we've gone more productivity and more productivity, and it's only in these last 20 years we've started talking about sustainability, about nutrition, about these other sorts of things for, from a farming perspective. And so you can see it from a political view that farmers need this information to be able to make the best decisions and the infrastructure is not there impartially. If I'm gonna put kind of my impartial hat on to say that we need this from that because you know, big companies such as John Deere, such as many others, they have so much data from the farms now, but that's all going to a commercial company. It's not going into government so they can aid people to make the best decisions for the wider farmer community. It's only going to that particular farmer. So it's also about a data infrastructure where farmers can actually understand all of the information that's coming from their local region, not just from their own tractor. So there's a lot of other sorts of advisory work we could be doing that, to build up that we just can't even imagine now, but in the future of farming, we'll hopefully be there. I think it's a bit cheeky of Kelly to ask that, because she's actually one of the better people about talking to farmers about this sort of thing, aren't you? So, but I, I think you and I might be the exception, but I think to fill this void, scientists need to be talking much more. We're very bad at doing that. We receive national funding to do what we do and yet we're very poor at returning that. Um, but I also say I think farmers are often suspect of talking to us because they think we'll talk over their heads or so there needs to be some way of bridging that gap in the absence of of a good uh, extension service if you like if you have in the United States. So again I'm sort of much more inclined now to thinking that, that what we the most effective way would be for like-minded people to ignore government, ignore the extension services because they don't exist or they're biased. We need to find like-minded 
farmers that are interested, scientists that are interested, companies that are interested that want to share common knowledge in an open infrastructure, sort of a creative commons sort of approach to just sharing what works rather than what works on my tractor in my in this field on my farm. Understanding, especially with regenerative agriculture, what bits of it work, what bits of it work everywhere, what bits of it just work in very localized pockets. Getting that knowledge and sharing that, I think, is what we're lacking at the moment because these these advisory services have been pared down and they've been privatized. And, and my experience of working with them is they're always about 10 years out of date. At the moment, you know, with my area of looking at soil, they're still talking about visual visual uh, in, what's it visual assessment of soil quality, which ignores the whole last 20 years of scientific research. And, Somehow we need to bridge that gap, and I think that that's one of the key things that we need to do. I think also with that, it's the overwhelming amount of information from so many different sources that go to farmers as well. They, as we know, they have very busy jobs. Um, they have some companies, so usually commercial companies, private companies, that may have certain interests in certain areas, who are the ones they connect with more, um, and then so are they getting the right information? Um, farmers are generally very, very good at acting on the information, but there is just more, and maybe, yes, as scientists, connecting more with the farmers and trying to um, really allow them to, to, to find out what they want to find out with, about their farms. Um, there's a lot of other information that's being collected, so a farm business survey as well, which is more on the financial side. There's, um, I know Natural England and catchment sensitive farming, I, I think they are very active actually and um, actually go out to farmers um, talking to them. But otherwise, yes, it, it can quite often be commercial companies with an interest of gathering the data for themselves and then talking in that way. And it's not very joined up. If it was a lot more joined up, of course, we could do so much more with this data. Um, one of the, just sort of going slightly off on a tangent, because you mentioned the horticultural industry there as well. Um, I've recently been in the Netherlands talking with some of the horticultural industry there and they are more advanced than any other country I would say in the world in terms of the horticultural industry and what have they got when you go there? They're all talking to each other so there's no barriers oh this is my IP I'm not going to share that with you this is secret they're, they're all sharing all their information they're really really open I mean it's it's great it's fantastic okay yeah they might lose a few secrets to each other but but they're advancing in such a rate that you can actually see that if you want something, quite often in the horticultural industry, you go to the Netherlands. So they're, they're actually drawing people to them because they're, they're all going on a journey together and bringing everything together, sharing the data, sharing what they're doing. Um, and yeah, it's only positive. So maybe we could do that more, well, across the globe as well as in the, in the UK, across the agricultural industry. Whole books have been written about how uh, failure to treat soil appropriately has been linked to the rise and fall of civilizations, and it was an, it was a matter of national security, of course, in the Second World War Two, and we came very close to famine. Is should we be reframing this debate as an issue of national security nowadays? Do you think should we be locking some of you in MI5 on, a, on the on the floor underneath counterterrorism? Is it that serious? Final sideways look at the issue before we wrap things up. I, I think. The issue of food defense, so actually using food as a form of national defense, is a really great framing. And it can also be, what do we feed the military? Should the military be going for only 100% British food so they are actually supporting our farmers as well? We could be framing it in lots of those different ways. And so I think if we're wanting to actually frame this differently, climate change is going to be a battle and we are going to be slammed by weather events. We're going to be, have population changes, we're going to have um, changes to crops, lots of different things happening. And our farming system is one of the ways we can actually fight back against climate change by actually changing to sustainable practices and ensuring um, a well-fed, happy population. And so for those different reasons, we need to be actually thinking about how we farm in the future. And I think we've had a really positive viewpoint across us that we have the skills, we have the tech, we respect soil and respect nature the way we want it to, but policy isn't joined up there at the moment, but there are other people there. So yeah, we need to be framing this in lots of different ways to make the MPs and other people give a damn to actually change this. I was, 
my, I agree with you, but I'm a little bit concerned as well, because if you look at all the technological advances since the Industrial Revolution, and Rothenstedt has a big, uh, <laughs> a big issue here, is that a lot of those concerns about national security or, or, or feeding populations that are leaving the countryside has tended to make us reach for very simplistic responses. So in the, in the Industrial Revolution, the simplistic response was just, let's, rather than using organic manures as fertilizer, we're going to use inorganic fertilizers. Now, that solved the problem, the short-term problem, but we now know from our 170-year-old experiments that, that there are real serious consequences for those short-term knee-jerk responses. And again, you can see in the 1960s and 70s when the Green Revolution came around, that just exacerbated that whole reliance upon inorganic fertilizers. And so the consequence has been, so in Rothamsted's experiments, the soils that should be containing about 80 tons of organic carbon per hectare in the top 30 centimeters, they're now only containing about 20 to 30 tons of organic carbon. So this awful lot of carbon has been lost to the atmosphere because of this knee-jerk response to find a very quickly implemented response to a problem. I think if we, get, if, we, if we do adopt some sort of national security mindset, it's got to be now not about just producing more and more and more and more food. It's got to be about worrying about the long-term sustainability of the way we're, we're producing that food. And I think we're at the point now where we, we're at a crisis point when you think that effectively soils are falling apart. They're running out the farm gate. We're running out of them. We're not storing water in those. We're getting hotter summers. All of this has evolved since the, the Industrial Revolution and this very quick response of inorganic fertilizers. So, yes, I would agree with you. We do need to think about it not in that knee-jerk way. We need to think in a much more structured and uh, systematic way that is sustainable. I think that's, that's what I think we should do. So I've spent a lot of time in China and um, there's a, it, it's, you would be envious of the ability of China to change what they do, right? But then that's not a free market system that doesn't fit with um, our ideals and what we need, but they are in a position completely different to manage what they do in their agriculture and how they approach. And the system changes when they want to do them, the speed they can implement it, it, is, it can be for the 100% of Hailing Jong next year, it's done a different way. Um, but. Um, yeah, we, we need to find different mechanisms and we, we it, it needs coordinated approach, it needs a vision and it needs consistency and policy as to how we get there. So. Well, that's the biggest way of all to end it on, the, the clash of uh, freedoms. Uh, how do we empower people to make the right choices while still giving them the autonomy to make the wrong ones, I suppose. Uh, and uh, But uh, a very optimistic panel. I want to thank um, all four of my panelists here today. Uh, Andrew Neal, Gillian Covey, Jonathan Henry and Christian Reynolds for a, a fascinating and well-informed uh, discussion this morning and I'm sure they will be here for some time yet if you want to pick up on any of those points. <laughs>